balance of the fly swatter. Um, we have four grid points defined. The fourth one is the artificial one just for plotting purposes. I give the properties of the uh, bar element and then the actuator properties. The loads here um, are to show the control forces that are put on the body which are given here. These require these uh, harmonic type forces. Down here on the fly position, down below, I'm establishing that spring and then uh, putting a force on it so that the tip of the massless spring will immediately jump to a harmonic, harmonically defined position. Earlier I said I was going to use a large spring and a large force, and that's the normal way because if this system is coupled in with other elastic uh, parts of the system, you want the stiffness to completely dominate any other part of the system. Uh, sometimes these are called big M methods. They're, they're uh, driving a constraint to a proper uh, value. In this case, I see that I cheated here and used only a modest stiffness. If I can find the, um, uh, where's my CE last? Um, here we go. CE last two is here, and it only has a stiffness of one unit. And then down below, my force on it, I've made to be modest as well. And so what's, what's happened is I haven't really used the uh, normal classic way, and I've cheated because I know that there's no other mechanical system connected to that artificial fly point, so I cheated a little bit. Um, we're using coupled mass down here, and then uh, I show the various time integrations that I'm interested in. By the way, if you want to challenge somebody's knowledge of MSC Nastran, you can assign this physical problem to them. Don't give them my solution and see how they can handle it. It's actually quite a workout. Uh, it also would be a good introductory problem for someone in dynamics uh, as a training tool. Uh, I would make them struggle with the creation of the data set though because it really works you over on physical modeling and on the use of the MSC Nastran data set. Now here's some of the results, and I wanted to show this uh, to show this short time behavior. Um, here we have at uh, the varying times we have the uh, translation that results. Actually, I'd rather plot this then and show you how this body moves. I wanted to show for very short time here how the body actually the tip of the beam actually does go in the wrong direction for a short time. So that's not uh, something wrong in the plot package. It really does happen. The Nastran results are shown in this figure. This is a short time behavior and it really is essentially identical with the homemade code. Likewise, the long time behavior from the NASTRAN solution is very similar to the NUMAR homemade computer code. Um, I comment at the top here that the behavior shows beating, and that's true. Um, I cannot really tell you, though, as time goes on, whether that beating continues. Beating means when you have one frequency uh, as shown at the, uh, basically at the fly uh, oscillation frequency of 20 radians per second, and then, then you have the outer envelope here uh, at a different frequency. Let me now compare the times at which the fly gets swatted as predicted by our two different solutions. The MSC NASTRAN solution shows just a bit uh, quicker swat than the uh, FEMNU solution did. They both show the position as the same intersection position. Any difference here must be due to the use of a little more stable algorithm used in NASTRAN where they pick the beta value to be one-third. Uh, you remember that Newmark picked one-quarter as the point that gave the most accuracy but lay right on the borderline of stability. 
and then you remember the uh, linear acceleration method gave uh, a beta value of 1 6 and it unfortunately lies in the unstable region for stability. The stated reason by MSC why they pick one third for their general solver is that this also adds some stability when there are nonlinearities present, and there are a lot of problems like that. So I regard these uh, solutions as very comparable and confirmation that both codes are working. Our first problem in the problem set is a pair of rod elements constrained by walls on the outside and with an actuator in between them. Here's a figure of this. The idea is that the actuator is going to try to open up uh, the distance U3 minus U2 into some prescribed gap uh, distance. Here's the equation of the actuator force on F2. And again, it's this gap distance minus some command gap distance. So uh, this actuator is going to have a tough job because these two line elements will both resist elastically any deflections U2 and U3. This is a static problem rather than dynamic as it's posed. Our goal is to find U3 the position at the end of the right rod as a function of the command UC, in other words, the separation command. We're going to use these two shorthand abbreviations for the rod stiffnesses. Here's the exploded um, assembly equation of equilibrium where the actuator terms are on the right side to start with. We then put the homogeneous terms on the left side, and uh, then we partition out the center two equations and come to this reduced equation. We now see the command quantities as the forcing function, and then these are the response quantities involving both the mechanical stiffnesses and the actuator stiffness. We'll use Kramer's rule for our solution. Kramer's rule uses a ratio of determinants where the denominator is the determinant of the coefficients of the stiffness matrix. The numerator is that same determinant, but uh, for the vector required U3, we take the corresponding uh, column for its uh, degree of freedom and replace it with the right-hand side of the equation. When you simplify this set of equations, you come down with this uh, value for U3. So this is our answer. As an afterthought, I realize that this is not symmetric in the coefficients K1 and K2. That is, we only have K1 appearing in the numerator. But if you form something more representative of the entire assembly, like the difference U3 minus U2, then you'd get more of a symmetric behavior in terms of these coefficients. In airplane flight tests, sometimes aerodynamic surfaces are used to impart forces into the structure. In the pre-flutter regime, for instance, small aerodynamic surfaces are vibrated at what might be close to the expected flutter frequency, and then the response of the wing is determined. Let's consider such an aerodynamic surface being driven by an actuator and suppose that it deflects a small surface such that when there's a slope of the wing looking uh, along the fuselage in this direction, uh, this is a cross section of the fuselage, so the nose of the airplane is coming out toward us. Then that actuator puts an opposing moment trying to return the wing to a zero slope position. And that uh, constant of proportionality is 10 to the ninth. And uh, I'm showing the positive sign convention here, which is counterclockwise, since the z-coordinate is coming out of the paper toward the viewer. We have two requests for solution. The first is that the equations of motion be generated using one Euler-Bernoulli beam element. 
uh, and then that we use lumped mass for the beam, and then that we neglect damping and any other external forces. We'll also neglect any actuator properties such as mass or stiffness other than uh, that that uh, causes this tip moment to uh, be generated. The second goal is to try to find the first natural frequency of this system. And we'll use gland reduction to try to reduce the problem to manageable size. Here's the wing flexural stiffness. Here it's its length and the mass of the wing. Here is the assembled equations of motion that were required. So far we have all of the degrees of freedom of the body. We're only going to need to keep those equations though for degrees of freedom three and four. So we can partition out the first two equations and set them aside. The actuator in this problem is trying to return the wing to zero slope and so you don't see the parameter u sub c occurring since it's been set to zero. Here's the partitioned set of equations and we need to uh, reduce this further using GAN reduction. Now actually this is the answer required in part A. Now in part B we do a uh, reduction based on a static equilibration we presume there is no load on the degree of freedom to be removed, which is U4. Uh, so here's our mental experiment. And when you do that, you get that the uh, fourth coordinate is equal to a multiplying factor here times U3. So we can form our transformation matrix from that. We just need to reduce that numerically and here we have the linear relation between U3 and U4. So that in our case we view this translation as driving this rotation over here. And then we can form the uh, GOA matrix that we saw before that was the uh, transformation matrix for Guyane reduction. Then using that, we replace the original physical coordinates with these and with this, and then we pre-multiply by the transpose of that transformation matrix. We just now need to assume harmonic motion and carry out those triple matrix products that give us generalized mass and generalized stiffness. So our final equation will be of this form, where U3 is the only remaining analysis coordinate. The generalized mass is shown here and reduces to one quarter megagram. The generalized stiffness likewise and comes out to be a translational stiffness, 254 newtons per millimeter. For a harmonic oscillator, the natural frequency in radians is the square root of the generalized stiffness over the generalized mass. Uh, that is carried out here in radians per second, 31 radians per second, or 5.07 hertz. Interestingly, if you drop out the active control, the frequency would have been 3.36 hertz. So this is definitely a case where a control system connected to an elastic system has changed its vibrational characteristics. It has stiffened the system and uh, raised the fundamental frequency. Our final problem is an automotive problem and it has to do with hydraulic boost to the steering. This is a non-co-located system. The force is going to be applied at a different point than where the sensor is located. We have the angular rotation of the steering wheel as a degree of freedom. And then we have that causing a rotation at a 
uh, gear here. So this is like a rack and pinion gear that I'm showing with the elasticity of the steering column entering and possibly allowing theta 1 to be different than theta 2. Then the push-pull motion of this uh, rack here uh, has an elastic um, degree of freedom at the left, a translation, and a second one here. Then I come into another elastic component where I add the boost force in translation, and finally this is pushing on some appropriate uh, arm out at the wheel. So I'm actually giving uh, a number of degrees of freedom here. The little u2 and theta2, though, have to be related because they are uh, intimately tied together if you have a perfect gear mesh there. In fact, we'll give that relation at the rack and pinion gear uh, by an equation of constraint. We will say that u2 equals r times theta2. So r is the pitch radius of that uh, pinion gear. We'll consider no slop in that uh, gear joint. The hydraulic boost is applied at a node 4. And that's going to be proportional to the torque applied by the driver at the wheel as measured by the difference in the rotation theta 1 minus theta 2. And so that's going to give some impression of how much force is being applied through torque on the driver's um, steering wheel, and that will add to his strength. We're going to develop the system uh, static equilibrium law, and then we're going to try to identify an equivalent uh, artificial finite element for the hydraulic boost. As I explained the problem this time, I realized it wasn't completely obvious why the hydraulic boost should be proportionate to the difference theta 1 minus theta 2. But you see, if you had a strain gauge on that shaft, that difference would be the, um, the twist, the angle of twist of the steering wheel's column. And so it is a direct measure of how much torque the um, driver is putting on that column. So think experimentally, maybe, in that case. So here's our solution now, using all of the degrees of freedom. I haven't yet applied the constraint between u2 and theta2. And that's done now. And uh, when we do that, we only have, um, really, five independent um, equations. And so to bring it down to that, we add the second and third equations, uh, multiplying the third by a length cap r to retain the proper dimensionality. Then when we collect terms, you have a new second equation. So uh, then we collect our five equations and write them down again. And we still have this control force on the right side, so we'll move it to the left. There is no command quantity here. And we have this set of equations. Finally, we pull from that set of equations the terms that correspond to the hydraulic boost. They're shown here with the coordinates order of interest. And notice that it's non-symmetric, so therefore we have a non-conservative system. And the force is what is called circulatory and could cause a dynamic instability. So you'd have to be careful about such a control system. This is our last lecture in this series. We're going to look at non-conservative mechanical systems. This means paying a little more attention to which matrices are symmetric and anti-symmetric. The basic teaching tool will be a robot fisherman. We'll look at its static response and show how static error in positioning uh, occurs. Then we'll look at its dynamic stability, which is equivalent to systems where the gain is turned up and they become unstable in some sense. We'll have a problem session with some three more problems. 
let's suppose that your assignment as an engineer is to create a mechanical robot to sit on the banks of a stream and fish. You might think about what this would require and what kind of motion would actually catch a fish and pull it out of the water. The structure that we're going to propose is somewhat human looking. In other words, it has something like an arm with a fishing rod at the end of it. Let's consider a very simple model and it will remind you a little of our fly swatter example earlier. This part of the robot is considered to be either elastic or rigid. We'll ultimately make it rigid before we do any solution, however. The fishing rod is definitely elastic and has a mass and stiffness characteristic. The weight of the fish will be downward on the end of the rod here. I'm going to break the analysis into two parts. One is what I call the static response. We're going to put a sensor at the tip of the rod that is going to measure the angle from the horizon. And if the fish pulls it down, then the static idea is for the robot to raise the fishing rod until the tip becomes level. That's somewhat logical because that's sort of what you would do and you would be able to look out to the end of the rod and decide if it were level or not. Now the amount that it deviates from that, that is the amount that it has a non-zero slope at the tip, will be considered an error. And uh, that presence then will be what we're interested in on static response. Now when you talk about dynamic instabilities, you mean that is it possible with no load on here at all that the system unloaded will suddenly start to oscillate? That can happen if the control system has its gain, and that is its stiffness and velocity dependent terms turned up so far that something in the motion of the bare rod allows the phasing in time to be such as to cause a flutter. And it turns out that can happen in this case. The actuator that we use will be rotary and we'll put a moment in at the base of the rod at the hand of the robot fisherman basically and it will adjust that to always try to oppose a rotation at the tip of the rod. In other words, the robot will try to hold the tip horizontal. You see, that would keep the rod from going into the water, for instance, which is what a, a real fisherman would try to do. We'll use these symbols K and C for the actuator stiffness and damping. I'll use the word damping and velocity dependent interchangeably, so don't worry about that. Then the uh, robot and the rod mass are given uh, matrices uh, with and without the carrot, and the robot and the rod stiffness, likewise. The weight of the fish, script F, is going to be vertical and positive downward shown here. So uh, it will always be down since it's gravitational. So we'll just take that script F with its own sign convention. We will first assemble the equations of motion and then look at the various matrices involved. We'll comment on what the symmetry or lack thereof of the coefficient matrices means. For physical modeling, we'll use the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. We'll have motion confined to the xy plane with no axial force or motion present and no flexure out of the plane nor torsional vibration. At the far wall on the left, there will be no slope nor deflection. The V is the relevant uh, lateral deflection of the central axis of the beam. We're not going to look at the weight of the actuator and the rod as loads. The weight, that is, we're, we're neglecting gravity in that regard. Now, they're going to be much less than the fish, hopefully. <laughs> Anyway, if we catch a big fish, um, we'll ignore the mass of the actuator and the